I'm Shannon Kovach, otherwise known as Shannon Patricia. And my daughter, Anora Kovach, is in the back. And she is my living and breathing example for this workshop. I am doing a workshop on disability inclusion in rituals. Initially, I called it in the program Ritual Inclusion for People with Special Needs, Persons with Special Needs. And I'm actually, one of the things I'm going to discuss is terminology. And terminology is quite a tricky thing in the disability realm. And there has been some discussion as of late on the term disability version versus the term special needs. So, the general consensus lately has been that the term disability is preferred to the term special needs. I have a couple of examples of articles, blog articles, that I'll pass around for you folks. There they are. That are talking about preferred terminology being disability. And I completely agree with them. I'll be honest, the only reason I named the workshop Special Needs is because I figured that I would get a little bit of kickback if I named it Disabilities, <laughs> if I used the term Disabilities. I myself have actually been corrected a couple times, quite a few times, and been told, um, oh, it's Special Needs, right? Special Needs. Well, I prefer the term Disabilities. I myself, a little bit of background about myself and my daughter. Um, so I am a single mom, and my daughter has a disability, a pretty significant disability. Um, her diagnosis is global developmental delays, um, but it's, that's not an accurate term for what she has. It's some sort of birth-related injury, and she is nonverbal. She has significant motor, develop, motor delays, um, developmental delays. She has significant neurological issues and uh, it affects every aspect of her life. And I also have a disability. I have an invisible disability. And it is a term which is, it's P-N-E-S, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. They are not epilepsy. They are a different type of seizure disorder caused by stress and trauma. So, I have different triggers for my seizures than a person with epilepsy would. And I've just had to learn to fudge through figuring out what my triggers are, how to navigate around them, and I'll talk about some of my personal experiences and ritual on that later as well. So, um, the term disability versus special needs, as I mentioned, disability right now is preferred, but it really is a tomato to model world. Certain people prefer special needs still. It's entirely your experiences as well in the world of disabilities. Um, person first is also something that has been a movement in the disability realm. Saying a person with their disability, using person first in the term, a child with a disability, my son with autism, my daughter with a learning disability, my child with epilepsy, my husband with Parkinson's disease. That is the terminology that we're going with right now in the disability field because it's taking, if you, if you take, you want to be able to value the person first and not identify them as the disability. So if you say my disabled daughter, well, disabled is the first term you hear and that doesn't define them. That's not the defining factor. So we're saying this person with this because that is still a largely dis defining factor of them, but it's not who they are entirely. So that's one of the movements terminology wise in the field right now as well. Um, Terminology is constantly 
changing. Constantly, constantly, constantly changing. I live in this realm and I can't keep up with it half the time. <laughs> so if you ever have any questions, just ask. Never feel bad stopping and asking someone saying, hey, am I using this right? Am I saying this correctly? What do I say? How do I refer to this? What do you mean by this? I mean, just, just ask. Be open, be kind, and be humble about it. Don't be, what do you mean, you know? But just be nice about it, and usually someone who has challenges and has a disability will be able to answer you. Um, once again, this is my opinion. Um, I think that um, I personally, and this is just my personal opinion, I will say this right now, I think that we have become really bogged down in the terminology. I think it's actually detracting from what we actually have to do and from, what, from the actual what we live with and what we actually deal with on a daily basis. We're tripping over the words to use and the appropriate term to use and how to say it and it's complicated and it's tricky. And like I said, I live in this realm every single day. I was on the state support team three council for my school district. I couldn't even keep up with all the terminology. I can't even imagine what it's like for people who don't live in the realm and are trying to keep up with it and then trying to have a conversation with a person and not offend them and trip over the words. I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming and bombarding. So be patient with yourselves and be compassionate with yourselves and also with the other people as well. Um, beware of acronyms. I got an email, <laughs> I got an email from the head, of, from one of the women in the state support team three. And this email was like, filled with acronyms and it was like almost unintelligible like you couldn't understand what it was saying so when you're talking try not to use as many acronyms as, pers as possible and another example of how that becomes an issue my daughter had an ASD closure an atrial septal defect closure which is a heart condition when we were going through the process of applying for a waiver the pediatrician wrote ASD, ASD on her documentation that got sent to the Board of Developmental Disabilities. The support administrator read ASD and assumed autism spectrum disorder, filled out all of the paperwork completely incorrectly. Not her fault though, right? Totally not her fault. But it's an easy complication to happen because acronyms are all over the place and they're an easy quick fix to throw in there and it, it complicates everything in the long run if you don't actually know which acronym you're using. <laughs> so once again, ask. If you have any questions, ask. Be approachable, approach someone who seems approachable and ask. So now we get into the nitty gritty of ritual inclusion. And please feel free to stop me, ask questions, jump in, talk to me, etc. I don't want to just sit up here and dictate to you. I'm not a professor. Please don't. I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so, ritual inclusion. One of the first things you can do is, of course, introduce yourself. Offer any help that you can give. Say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Um, remain approachable. Be approachable. You can do that with nonverbals, of course, your body language, it's nonverbals. Um, listening skills. Listening skills are the most absolutely important thing. I find a lot of times when I deal with people who are eager to try to help, they talk more than they listen. And I understand, like that is something that you, that, that you know, people want to help. They really generally want to help, but that's great. But a lot of times they talk and they talk over anything that you actually have to say yourself. So they don't actually hear what you really need or what they can do to help. And offer assistance, but don't really overcrowd because there's a fine line a lot of times between 
wanting to have your independence and be able to do the things on your own. And there's a lot of pride to it too when you have a disability. You know, there's there's a lot of insecurity that comes with that. There's a lot of frustration that comes with your lack of being able to do the things you used to be able to do or want to be able to do or feel like you should be able to do. And a lot of times there's a little bit of a challenge with being able to voice that as well. It's hard. It's really hard sometimes having the ability to say, hey, this I'm struggling with this. And we want to be able to do as much as we can on our own, but at the same time, we also want to be able to have the accommodations necessary to be able to participate in every aspect of life that we can. So it's a challenge. And there's that fine line that is hard to find and really hard to walk. So, and I will say, it is also our responsibility to be able to communicate our needs to the ritual team as well. As a person with a disability, it's our responsibility as well to be able to communicate that. And I'll more on that later. <laughs> Any questions? Is there anything um, on? You were talking yeah. terminology or like, mm -hmm. like for better for labels. Like, like they took, like with the autism spectrum, they had all the names of the different parts of it and just said, no, we're not doing it anymore. We went to autism. And my son has the Asperger's and he does not like hearing autism because it's too broad of a stroke I and it does not give the that. definition. I completely agree with that. When they took Asperger's out of the, the, the in the ASD5 or the um, DSM. A, thank you, DSM-5. <laughs> See, acronyms, I struggle with them myself. But the DSM-5, that frustrated the heck out of me too. And I know a lot of people who have Asperger's who are in my generation that were diagnosed with it that are very frustrated with that too. It's not, a, it's not an applicable term. It doesn't adequately describe the capabilities yes. and the, the range of capabilities that they have. It's just it's not accurate. I've seen too much of a broad range of where people are on that spectrum and just to say, it's like the color white. Right, exactly, or the color purple. Well, is it lavender, is it lilac, is it you know, dark purple, is it royal purple? I mean, there's so many different aspects of it. Yeah. And it's trying to describe, like at times, like, okay, he's uh, he has Asperger's, and that describes, okay, he doesn't get sarcasm, he understands black and white, yes and no, there is no gray. And having that out there is a lot easier for people to understand what he's capable of versus just autism. Right, exactly. Terminology has always been a tricky aspect, tricky thing in the disability field, and it's still growing and changing. That's one of the things about the disability field is everything is always growing and changing. We are constantly learning new things and trying to develop new things in order to be able to accurately describe and you know, be able to accommodate correctly. So it's it's constantly changing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a perfect example. That's a perfect example. So, um, another thing as a ritual uh, leader is to be observant. So I'm going to start getting into some examples of um, terminology, and, uh, not terminology, of, I'm gonna start getting into some examples. Now I didn't get anybody's permission to use their term, their names in these examples. Um, so I'm not going to use names, with the exception of Ian and Sue, because I called them before this thing and actually asked them, hey, can I use your names in these, <laughs> for example? So I will actually be using them as an example. Um, their names in the example, but so with the be observant, a lot of times, like I said, it is really hard for people with disabilities to step forward and say what they need, but at the same time, a lot of times it's just kind of in your face blunt. 
perfect example. Um, there is a girl that came to one of our rituals who was blind. She had a cane and she was very obviously blind and um, she wanted to do the dance with us. We were doing a dance portion of our ritual. She would, we made every effort to include her. We taught her the dance step. She did a great job with it. When it came time to get up and do the dance, somebody had one side of her hand and nobody had the other hand. And we were all shuffling around trying to get up and everything and nobody grabbed the other hand. And I was like, oh my gosh. So by the time I actually got the chance to let go and run around to that we had started the dance. So she ended up kind of getting shuffled over and bumped into somebody. She got run into somebody else. And fortunately, somebody else was paying enough attention and let go and grabbed her hand and was able to have, so she had someone on either side to help direct her. Come on, that's just a no brainer. You know, like, people need to be able to just open their eyes and pay attention. There are so many times when there are just obvious things that need to happen and they just don't. And it's just a matter of just being observant, being aware, paying attention, anticipating the needs. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, it, just anticipate, you know, it doesn't take a lot to really think, hey, the blind girl there might need someone on the other side of her. You know, I don't know. Um, and um, making accommodations so that they can actually participate in the worship as much as they can and have the ability and, and making accommodations for their abilities during worship as well. So another example, um, we have a girl that attends our rituals quite regular, well, she used to attend quite regularly. She hasn't been around as much, but she still does. Um, but she, um, she's in a wheelchair. She is also nonverbal. And um, during the portion where we open the gates, she always gets really excited and she moans and rocks. And her mom, for a while, when she first started attending, has been going, shh, no, don't quiet. And we were like, no, don't show her. That's great. She sees what we can't see. That's awesome. Don't show her. You know, a lot of uh, having a disability or living with a person with a disability is also a level of insecurity and a feeling of constantly having to tiptoe around other people and being under a, micro a microscope per se or magnifying glass. And having the ability to be in an environment where you're not having to trip over everything you do is great. When we said that to her, she was like, oh, great, okay. You know, oh, wow, I can, I can relax and let her do her thing, and it's great. I mean, that was so freeing for her. She loves it. And that was awesome for us to see as well. You know, she's actually seeing what we're incapable of seeing sometimes. Some of us are capable of seeing it. Some of us aren't. But she was able to get into that moment, and we got joy out of it just as much as she did. More so, probably, because we could see her joy in it. So, making accommodations instead of, you know, asking her to shush or expecting her to be shushed. Um, also, a perfect example, I include Anora in my ancestor and kindred's offerings in the morning when I do my ancestor and kindred's offerings in the morning. I do them every morning. Nora, sometimes she wants to participate. I always ask her. And sometimes she says no. And she loves me off and wants to go play in her room and something instead. Sometimes she says yes. And she'll stand in front of me. I take my coffee offering and pour it outside in my little receptacle. And then I come, you know, from the day before. And then I come back in. And we ground and center together. And she's really good at it too. She'll, she's learned. You know, she understands and she'll round in the center and she'll push her energy down and pull it up and pull the energy back down and she's great at it and she's quick at it. She will hold the candle 
and then we'll do the offering. I'll speak the words and everything, and then I'll put the coffee offering down, and she'll put the candle on the altar, and a lot of times she'll readjust the stuff on the altar. She'll move it around. She'll just move stuff around wherever she wants, and that's her little pitch in for the day on that. And where she, sometimes she'll move the bone over here, and sometimes she'll move this little crystal skull over here, and she'll be like, all right, this goes here. Yeah, I'm talking about you. <laughs> And then we'll go over and we'll do the kindred's offering. And she loves to be able to hold the incense. She'll hold the stick of incense as, I'm, as we're speaking the words. And she'll hold the incense and she'll actually light it at the right time on the candle, on the hearth candle. And then she'll give it to me and I'll put it up on the incense burner. And then she'll blow the candle out at the end. Now most people, have a theory where, or have take the mentality that you're not supposed to blow out a sacred fire or ritual candle. You're supposed to, you don't believe that, Ralph? You disagree with that? Okay. So I've heard varying opinions on that. I've heard some people who are like, you never blow out a candle. You never use your breath, blah, blah, blah. It's offensive. On the other hand, her, that's what she loves to do. And it's something that she's actually doing in speech therapy. So it's something that she can take over from therapy and apply it to something that she loves, and that's really cool. So she gets really excited at the end of the offerings that she gets to blow the candle out. Sometimes it takes her three or four tries, but she gets to do it, and it's exciting for her. So that's including her in the little ways that I can in our ritual. And she loves it, and she loves to get to do it. She looks forward to it when she does want to do it. She's a total preteen, but so like I said, sometimes she doesn't want to, but. <laughs> Anybody else have any ideas for that? Any examples from their groves or their practices that they do? My son's still trying to get the handle of offerings. Because we live in the apartment complex and he's always afraid of getting reported for dropping a, a, a chocolate ball for Freya because she wants her damn chocolate. <laughs> and uh, I'm going, just go do it. If they give any trouble, we'll call Kendra. No problem. Our lawyer friend, and she'll handle it. It's an offering to the gods. It's not like they're just throwing food to the animals. Mm -hmm. But if it's inside, he's more willing to do it and such. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's little things a lot of times. The little things that you can do, the little adjustments, little accommodations, the little things that you would the, that you do to include them. That really makes a big difference. So um, how am I doing on time? Wow. Lots of time left. <laughs> um, so, this is another example um, that may seem pretty blunt, simple, kind of in your face, simple, stupid. Um, but you'd be really surprised how often it doesn't happen. Make sure that they get what everyone else gets at a ritual. I have, um, and, and make sure that they get included in everything that everyone else does too, to the best of their capabilities. Um, we had a ritual where we were passing out a ritual item that everyone was getting an item and it was Part of you know it was part of the ritual etc. Everyone was getting an item, and they skipped Nora, and everyone else had gotten this item except Nora, and I was livid. I mean I was like I was shaking mad, like I was so angry, and I literally couldn't even focus. Like I'm really good at putting stuff aside and being able to stay in the moment. I was. During that I couldn't even concentrate. I was so mad. And I was able to stamp it down and get myself back in the moment, but it took me a hot minute. And then um, after the ritual, I went up to Sue, and this is where I'm going to use names. <laughs> I went up to Sue, and I said to her, I'm just going to tell you right now, I am I'm really mad. Like, I was shaking again because I had been thinking about it. We were at a ritual. Rituals were wrapped up and done. And I was, I was like, livid mad. And I was 
she handled it so well. I mean, she did so well with me. She, I mean, I don't even know what I must have looked like, but I was so furious. And I was, I said, I said, I am going to tell you, I'm, this is not directed at you. I know that this wasn't your fault. I know that you didn't do this, but I'm really mad and I want to scream right now. So please don't take this personally, but this happened and it's not fair. Like, what the heck? Well, but there were lots more ex expletives involved in that, though. <laughs> Which, of course, we are videotaping. I cannot say that. And perfect example that brings us to conflict resolution. Um, Sue handled it beautifully. And she's my example of how to handle this beautifully, actually. <laughs> she listened. She didn't jump in and defend anybody. She just listened. And... She said, all right, we'll figure it out. I'll talk to people, we'll make sure it doesn't happen again in the future. And I mean, she listened beautifully. She made eye contact with me while I was venting. She didn't take the fact that I was mad, offended, offensively at all. I mean, she was so compassionate and nice about the whole thing. And I was pretty beastly to her, I'm pretty sure. And that brings me to the point of anger. When a person who is advocating for an accommodation or a need, who has a disability, or who is advocating for a person who is who has a disability, feel they, we can get mad pretty easily. We can get mad, we get to the point sometimes where we have just hit brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. We can get pretty frustrated and mad. And so a lot of times it is not directed at you, it is not your fault, we know it. Sometimes we have the capability of voicing that and saying, look, I know this isn't your fault, I know that you didn't mean to do this, I know that this wasn't you, but I'm just really mad. And the ritual team people, the ritual leaders, the ritual officiants have to remain humble and compassionate and open in that moment and not get angry, not get defensive, not get frustrated with the person that's mad. Now, on the other hand, they don't have to take abuse. There's a difference. You know, there's there's a fine line, once again, and that fine line needs to be walked. And you don't need to take abuse as a ritual team leader or as a ritual leader, but you also need to listen with compassion and take what they have to say and, and come up with a solution. In my case scenario, that solution was Sue going back to the Grove members, addressing it with them, and that mistake not happening again. And people from the Grove, you know, Ian saying later on, yeah, we're still working on our, on our disability inclusion. You know, it was acknowledged. People said, you know, Ian said to me later on, sorry about that, we screwed up, you know, and we're still working on it. That was huge, and they haven't made that mistake since. That's incredible, you know? And an acknowledgement of the fact that they understood my frustrations, that they were going to make an effort to not allow it to happen again, and that they had heard me was huge. That made all the world a difference. And we may make mistakes again. There may be more mistakes in the future. But remaining open and continuously striving to make improvements is, is the key. So, on that one. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, we, we've, had, um, we've had a lady come to our grove and um, she's in a motorized wheelchair. And um, City Light is not handicap accessible. And to make it handicap accessible would probably cost about 50 grand. 
Mm. Or something because none of the doorways inside the house are 36 inches wide. This house was built in 1924. Uh, you know, yeah. so I mean, even even if we could redesign, uh, one of the bathrooms could be designed to be handicapped accessible. We can't get them in the front door, much yeah. less get them up a ramp. You know, and get them through. E every door in the house would have to be redesigned. It's not just a matter of huge architectural overhaul. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and um, as a, a, a church, and the fact that it was already like that before we bought the building, it were grandfathered and being forced to do this. But folks have come, and you can maneuver around the back, and you can get into the sanctuary. And this did, this did happen. She came several times, and she um, very much liked being there until her, um, and I'm not sure what it's called, but it's the, the helper that drives the van that um, helps. I, I don't know what the term for that is. Aid. Yeah, Usually. okay. Well, the aid, 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 aid dropped her off and went someplace else. And this was, I think it was Yule. And it was cold. And, you know, she had warm enough clothes on, but they weren't warm enough to stay out there for several hours. Yes. And, you know, we, we got her next to the fire, but we couldn't take her inside. We wrapped her up as much as we could. This was a really bad situation because the aide wasn't answering her phone. And so it was several oh, yeah. hours before they came back. And you know, you could feel her hands were getting cold yeah. and all this other stuff. And it was a really bad situation. Yeah. I understand that. But see, that's, it's so frustrating to be in that situation too, as her and as you folks. And she's never come back. Imagine that. Right. Mm -hmm. Probably because she doesn't want to be in that situation again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let's see. It's a lose-lose situation, and that's, yeah, it sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah. What can you do? Right. And a lot of times, you know, you, know, you don't know what's going through that AIDS head. You don't know what that person is doing. I myself have personally found that a lot of times when people make mistakes that frustrate me or anger me, it's not out of like malice or any sort of ill intent. It's just because they didn't know. You know, they didn't know that that was something that was a problem or they just didn't think. Mm -hmm. Once again, you know, like the being observant and anticipating things like, oh, I might need to, yeah. Just a random idea for that. Look into uh, getting, you know, one of those wheelchairs that they use on the airplanes. Like a which smaller air, like the, like yeah. the, 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 the narrow smaller wheelchairs. Which, we yeah. It, well, we don't have ramps at the, well. at the moment, and so, you know, <laughs> that, and... Well, that's another issue. But. Yeah, there would have to be ramps, and, and, and then we could possibly get them in. But, you know, when, when someone is so disabled that they're in a motorized wheelchair, I mean, she... Motorized, yeah. you'd have to pick her up and... Yeah. Lift her in. Right. And that might involve a lot of pain, too. Yeah. So that's probably, yeah. But for other clients, and the, you know, with clients, here I go. I'm sorry. For other patrons in the future, for other attendees, that mm -hmm. might be an option to have that available. Mm -hmm. And actually, I wonder if there's some sort of program that you might be able to get foldable, collapsible ramps. Just one set that you could put up. There's got to be something, maybe. Or some sort of mm -hmm. um, I know in local area the community centers have equipment to either give temporarily if you know someone's coming in town or they just outright have somebody they give them away yeah that's a good point sometimes they give them away when people pass away and they just want to get rid of the ramps and yeah, she, she got a well my mother-in-law she got the uh, walker she got crutches and a wheelchair and she kept two out of three and returned it yeah and there was no charge there's a really cool program in lakewood it's
it's called Matthew's Lending Library, and that's people who have finished using adaptive equipment that turn it into this place, and this woman keeps this stock of all this stuff, and you can go in there and see what she has, and if she has something that you can use, you sign it out and take it home and indefinitely. It's really cool, but I don't know if you'd have anything around, probably. You may or may not, I don't know. <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah, that's a cool thing that we have in Lakewood. It's a, kind of a similar thing to that, where you give things away if they have them available. Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, we've never had, uh, we've never had children uh, with disabilities that I'm aware of. I mean, not so much that it would be noticeable if they were, mm -hmm. um, but we've had a few adults and you know, we, we managed to get the, the folks that are on the crutches, that can walk with the crutches, and they can get up and down the stairs and they can get in. We put the stuff in the, the bathrooms and all, uh, but wheelchairs are kind of a no-go at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And the, the sanctuary, it's a yard. It gets muddy. It, yeah. It's not paved. It's, yeah. You know, it has <laughs> mosquitoes in the summertime. It's it, nature. Um, <laughs> Imagine that. Right? <laughs> Pagans in nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we could get you guys a ramp to at least, because they have those metal folding ramps. That might be something. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But then again, you still have to deal with getting them through doorways that sometimes are 30 inches wide and yeah, versus the 36 inches wide. Mm -hmm. I think about that. But I don't think any motorized wheelchair, I, I, can't, I don't remember what the dimensions are for those, but I don't think any motorized wheelchair would be able to fit through there. Mm -hmm. but it's, I know the larger ones, There's there was an issue with the economy of last year, not, and she could not use the stall here. It was not wide enough because she had the motorized one. Mm -hmm. So, and that was a big issue. She thought, so I can't use the bathroom while I'm at the con. Right. That is frustrating. Yeah. When, don't even get me started on bathrooms. <laughs> That's a whole workshop in and of itself. <laughs> like Nora has sensory uh, sensory processing disorder. Those blowers, like the hair the hand dryer blowers, I can't take her into a bathroom half the time because, like, if we go into a public bathroom with the blowers and she's having a bad day, like it, that totally spazzes her out. I can't even. I have to go in, use the bathroom real quick and then like scoot out because she's on overload and it's like meltdown in the bathroom. I mean, people don't think of that kind of stuff. But when you have a family member with a disability like that, that's the stuff that you have to tiptoe around all the time. Like the simple things that people take for granted are the big things that you have to tiptoe around and jump around and jump through hoops for. And not be able to use the bathroom half the time, you know, like not being able to use the bathroom when you go somewhere, what? You know, like <laughs> crazy, but it's a reality for a lot of people. So, you know. Anybody else? Any other stories? Any other examples? Um, my friend, this is back when different branch of pagan was a bit still. My friend Bob, he wouldn't mind it. His, his son was most like almost the exact copy of your daughter. And he was very, you know, he had freedom at home. And we would go to other people's house for our tribal event. And they're like, why is he going into our things? And we're like, okay, we've explained his issues. Why are you surprised? And there was a very huge blow up that I, it almost divided the tribe in half that day. Yeah. And just going, do you not understand? He's, he has issues. Yeah. It's not, he is not an average seven year old. Yeah. 
And like, what, what would I expect them to watch your child walking around? Yeah. It's, what do you want us to do? And then there were some suggestions and some of them were not humane. And it, 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 for a while, he just did not go to the shul with his family because of it. There is, once again, fine lines. There is a fine line that we walk. There's a fine line that everyone walks. But I, I, I understand that fine line with Honora, particularly because there's a responsibility, but there's also a level of there's a level of needing to have that autonomy and let that child walk around and do things. But there's also a level of we are the caregiver are the parent. It is our responsibility to make sure that that child is taken care of and isn't getting into things and it's a fine line. I mean it's it's such a rough scenario. I don't I struggle with that myself a lot. That whole situation could also just be my whole family. <laughs> yeah. It could. It could. It would be a very, very delicate panel. I'll be quite honest. Like, because that's that's a. I guess that's there's a, also the the thing is that there are some people who I hate to say, just like in the case of the aid, dump off people who are disabled at rituals. Um, the community I was in, this woman was an active schizophrenic and not being appropriately medicated apparently and her family just got sick of her so just dumped her off on the land where the ritual was for the whole day and you know what? and most of she was just doing crazy stuff and harassing people all day and that's not safe no no it was not and i actually intervened because i was like okay so you have to stop doing this you know yeah. well she's just on her spiritual journey no oh, she's yeah. schizophrenic and yeah. this is this is something that requires intervention, like right now. Yeah. But in those cases, I mean, that's not an EDF thing. It's a larger pagan thing, and I think sometimes the pagan community is like loosey goosey about that. Oh, it's just spiritual experience. And actually, Elizabeth and I were talking about that. I think Elizabeth is the one that needs to teach that workshop. <laughs> the disability <laughs> between mental illness and experience spiritual experience. <laughs> I think Elizabeth needs to teach in that workshop because that's a fine line as well in the pagan community and it's, yes, it's very blurred and it's confusing. She's a psychiatric nerd. Um, are you okay with me saying that? I'm sorry. It's already out Like, there. okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just mentioning you in ritual uh, or in the middle of the workshop and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I understand. Like, that. there's a fine line and I, I know someone who was very, very mentally ill, who was not being treated for her mental illness, and was doing all sorts of crazy, very unhealthy things, and also neglecting her children, and intermittently being abusive to her children in between episodes of this stuff. And she was pawning it off as these were experience, spiritual experiences. And no, that's there is a difference. There's a big difference. And it, the fine line, once again, that fine line is blurry until it's not anymore. <laughs> and you're talking about having angelic experiences and flying with the angels and then waking up crap out of your kid because they because you were in the bedroom for six hours and left your kids unattended and they're four and two and the house was completely trashed because they got hungry and didn't have anything to eat and couldn't get mom to respond locked in the bedroom for six hours so they trashed the kitchen and the kitchen I mean mm, like 
there's a fine line until there isn't anymore. <laughs> yeah, I understand that one. There, oh, some. Well, we need, um, as pagans, we need more training on yes. dealing with people with various and sundry mental, mental illnesses, yeah. uh, personality disorders, and things like this, because I mean, you're talking a case where it's quite obvious, but it's not always quite obvious. And it was not obvious until she told me that story. Mm -hmm. I'll be quite honest. I missed all the other signs along the way until and she told me that story. And I was like, whoa, hold up here for a second. Wait, what? What did you just do? <laughs> what did you say? You know, six hours? Four and two, unattended, locked in your bedroom, what? And then even that, when you came out, the house was trash. <laughs> Hold on, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I missed all the signs along the way. And at that point, it was already, like, she was already so far gone. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't even know. Well, and like, it can cause huge disruptions in your group dynamics of your growth. Yeah to have someone like that because yes there will be the people that will be very sympathetic and there will be the people that aren't and yeah. yeah yeah exactly people who are very sympathetic to it and buy into it and think that that's okay mm -hmm. and then the people that don't and hard, hard, react harshly to it and, yeah. there's also the cases of being on the other side of the fence where you are the mentally ill, the mentally ill person, mm -hmm. and they don't understand what's going on, and you're trying to get help spiritually, and it's just not there. Yeah, I understand that one too. Yeah, I have a friend of mine um, that passed away this past summer, who um, was schizophrenic, actually. He did not get the help he needed, and we failed him, honestly. Sorry. So, I, I understand the flip side of that coin, too. Yeah, it's, um, you know, you miss the signs sometimes along the way. And uh, hindsight's always 20-20, usually, not always. Never all, you know, shouldn't use always and never, but hindsight is um, usually 2020, but along the way, sometimes you miss the signs. Or sometimes they hide the signs, and you it does go unnoticed. Yeah. But I mean, along with training, you also have to have some empathy. Yeah. And I mean, I think that tends to be missing from a lot of people. Yeah. But I've had the good, and I've had the bad. I've had one group where they just blinders were on or they just think. And then the views and experience I had, they were there for me. So Yeah. Definitely true. And um, your story actually it kind of unrelated, but kind of related, um, made me think of um, my experience of having a seizure at the Grove, actually. I had a really rough long day after a ritual. It was a fall equinox ritual. And um, so my seizure disorder is brought on by stress and trauma and uh, something triggered me at, at the ritual. And um, I ended up collapsing in the barn afterwards in the ritual space. You've seen our ritual space, Karen, you know what it looks like. And I collapsed in the barn and had the seizure and it was like two hours long and Sue sat with me and Nina and um, Ben, one of, he's not one of our Grove members, but he's from um, the Starwood crew. And um, they dealt with it beautifully. They were wonderful throughout the whole thing. Um, but if I had been able to communicate earlier on that I needed to step back, that could have been avoided. Once again, you know, there's there's a responsibility for me to say something and to advocate for my own needs, but there's also it's hard to do that. So, you know, it's 
it's that fine line. And it's a work in progress. I'm learning how to do it. I'm starting to get up and learn how to do it. One of the things that triggers me is strange, really strange, but sounds. Particular tones mm -hmm. trigger me. Um, crystal bowls trigger me. Like if crystal bowls, like if somebody's playing a crystal bowl, I'm down. Like, and, and, and so there was a woman who was playing a crystal bowl in our ritual. And this is not the same one that I had the seizure at, ironically. Um, she was playing a crystal bowl in our ritual as an offering. You know, and it's beautiful. I used to love crystal bowl playing before I got my seizure disorder, before it developed. So I used to love it. It never occurred to me that it would be a problem. Well, she started playing and my nervous system started going, yeah, and I went, oh man, this is bad. So I ended up having to run out of ritual, basically. Trying not to make a scene because I was ridiculously embarrassed that this was a problem. You know, like, oh my God, what is going on here? Why, you know, I don't want to make a scene or anything. And I ended up having to kind of go as far away on the other side of the property as I could. And Tadar is a large property, but crystal bowl music, it, crystal bowls, they the sound, they travel, they're beautiful. And they're, they, they, the sound goes forever. So I ended up having to kind of stop my ears and like, and I ended up saying later to the woman, hey, I just want to let you know, you know, that was beautiful, but I can't listen to it. I can't hear it. It gives me seizures. And she was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. And she hasn't brought it to ritual since. And she's done other things as offerings. And it hasn't been a problem, which is super sweet. She had no intent, you know, just mistakes happen. You know, and me being able to step up and say, hey, this is a trigger for me. And her being open and warm and nice and accommodating, it was a good situation all around, you know. But sucks that she can't play her crystal ball anymore. You know, I wish she could. <laughs> and I wish, I wish she could. I really wish she could. I wish that she didn't have to not play it just because of me. But I'm grateful that she's willing to hold off on doing that so that I can stay in ritual, you know. Thank yeah, you for I'm mentioning that, because I brought it to Bet and Bell to play during my ritual tomorrow, so now okay. I will not do that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> actually that works out, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> I can just step out and go to another. I have other. It, it doesn't matter. I could do other okay. things. Because if that's, I mean, if that's something that you really want to do, you can. I am more than willing to just step out too. Like I, if that's something that you really want to do as part of the ritual, I also know that it's. I'm not going to be like, hey, you can't do what you're going to do. You know, like it's a given. It's a two-way street kind of thing. You know. So if you want to do it, just let me know. I'll step out while you're doing that. I'll go somewhere that's a little more soundproof. <laughs> and then if somebody could just kind of maybe wave me back in. <laughs> hey, she's done. <laughs> all clear. All clear. Yeah, right. All clear. <laughs> I like your terminology. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've never had anyone react to our singing bowls that, um, that like that. But I've certainly had people that say, this just bothers me. It, 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 mm -hmm. There's something about the vibrations and it just does not work for me. Yeah. Can we just not do this? And I've had the same, not the same people, but I've, I've heard similar things about certain types of drumming. That the yeah. drumming can cause migraines Yeah. Um, yeah. for certain people. So. Yeah. I used to have conversations with AJ about how the MRI machine was best journeying thing ever. Like we would go in, cause you know, you go into MRI machines and that can either give you a migraine or it can send you off on the best journey experience ever. You know what I mean? Tones, sounds, beats, mm -hmm. it all does that. And I totally, yeah, I understand the migraine thing because I have a friend of mine that actually does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Certain drum beats give them migraines. Mm -hmm. That's just the way their brains are wired. You know? Una, did you have something? Yeah, no, it's also about having the emerging culture of being able to say, you know what, I can't do this, I'm getting overwhelmed, I'm getting triggered, like, th you know, yeah. especially if you have that ability to say that, but it's also about the culture in which 
you know, the commu- you know, that you're in at any given event or any ritual festival yeah. to feel like, no, I can say this without feeling like, oh my God, they're gonna hold this against me, they're gonna yeah. be judgmental. It's about creating that openness yes. to feel that yes, I I That's can advocate, I can, you know, express the things that I need in order to better participate. Yeah. Which has at least as someone who has not had very significant issues with disabilities, it's like I've had friends who have issues right. with it, but that's always been something that I've liked about ADM is that like people have, you know, at least when I first started, people, I felt like people were able to do it, but even in the intervening years, it has gotten more, we need to look into this, we need to examine this, we need to be aware of this, even more so than it was 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's key. I hope that that thing got her voice saying that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I uh, just want to say one good thing about the way we do ritual in ADF is we don't cast that hard circle, which you can't walk through and destroy yes, things. That's true. So, that's a good point. You know, we always talk about it as if for some reason in the middle of a long ritual you need to go out, take a pee, take care of a, a crying child, take yeah. a smoke. Uh, yeah. You, you can leave, but. Yeah, definitely. If you're if you're something's reacting in the ritual. to a singing bowl going off, <laughs> you can book it out of ritual so you don't have a seizure before, so, so somebody doesn't have to cut you out of ritual space. That's a good point. I never thought about that before, actually. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would hope even if you were in a cast circle and was having troubles, you'd run right through and, and you know. I don't know. I've actually never been in a cast circle like that. I found ADF right off the bat. I was like, I'm a druid. <laughs> my friend was like, you need to go, my friend who introduced me to paganism was like, you need to go to the, you know, you need to find a pagan group. And I'm like, I'm a druid. She's like, well, why don't you try this? I'm a druid. Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah, but along the lines of what you were saying, Elizabeth, or Una, that is actually beautifully said. You said it better than I did. That was what I was trying to say, but you said it better than I did. I Being... I, yes, you do. <laughs> and that's the part of the key, you know, actually being able to say stuff, having that culture where we actually have the ability to have someone, be, you know, be approachable. Because for me, growing up in a culture and an environment where you couldn't speak up, you know, I grew up in a very conservative, Catholic. Eastern European culture where you shut your mouth, you if you had a disability, it was an embarrassment to the family, it was a skeleton in your closet, you shut your mouth, you, you hit it, and you kept on with your business, you know? And me being able to actually speak up and be able to advocate for myself has been a years and years of process, learning experience. I mean, there's been a huge learning curve. And I'll be honest, I learned for her first before I learned for me. I can speak up for her, hands down, way easier before I can speak up for myself. It's still something I'm working through in my own, in my own capabilities, you know, like in my own processes. I still struggle with the level of embarrassment about my own disabilities. And with her though, I mean, I don't think I ever would have learned to be able to speak up for mine. I mean, I may have, life challenges may have come along, life experiences or whatnot. But honestly, having a Nora and having to learn to advocate for her and speak up and be assertive and learn how to say things and speak up was the thing that taught me how to do it in the other avenues of my life. Because if nobody speaks up for her, it's not happening. So now I've learned to apply those skills that I've learned for her sake to my life and to other areas of our lives and it's useful but having that culture where it's you know where we have that like you said Elizabeth you said that so perfectly I wish I could like bottle that up and like put it in a paper you know in a little bottle and send it off it was beautifully said um but yeah having that culture that we have here, that environment where we can actually speak up. But a lot of times it's gonna take some time for people to be able to speak up. So, yeah. One 
somewhat related aspect to that. Um, at Trillium, we go and we have a lot of people with different dietary requirements and such relative to the meal plans and other things. Do you have any dietary needs that's gotten more detailed with examples so that we get the information we actually need from people? We don't find out late, well, I didn't know if you'd understand this, so I didn't put anything down. Right. And <laughs> That's come, yeah. that's come up a few times. So, you know, at this point, I think it you know, gives three common examples of things where, you know, because originally it just said any dietary needs like being vegetarian. And all we found out about were vegetarians. And, we go, and then we find out, oh, we actually have a bunch of people who are celiac. Yeah, like I'm gluten-free, you know, gluten and soy-free. And that's a challenge sometimes with going places because a lot of times, there's a lot of vegetarian and vegan food available, but vegetarian and vegan food are usually chock full of soy and gluten, you know? So it's like... <laughs> oh, you'll like this, I made it with seton. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, there's all this edamame in here, it's great. Uh, okay, I can't have that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's um, definitely food allergies are also probably, mm -hmm. I, I personally put them in the disability realm because in my experience, I don't talk, I didn't talk, okay, so here I can talk about this too. I did not talk about food issues earlier. I personally lump food issues and food allergies into the disability realm because they are crippling and they affect a lot of aspects of your life. They affect every aspect of your life. Food is how we survive. And if you can't eat something when you go somewhere, it affects everything about that that day. I mean, if you don't get enough to eat, if you don't, so, and if you, like, for example, my daughter has eosinophilic esophagitis. Gesundheit, right? Eosinophilic. Yeah, right. Gesundheit. Sprechen Sie you know. So my daughter has eosinophilic esophagitis. She has one of the worst cases they've seen at the Cleveland Clinic, and for a time period, she was taken off of food altogether, and she was on just a medical liquid diet. She now has, over the course of the last four or five years, I've lost count at this point, um, we have slowly added foods back into her diet. She is now able to eat gluten-free grains, all vegetables, all uh, fruits, corn, um, legumes, um, and novel proteins, which consist of types of meats that are not commercially farmed. Let me tell you, finding non, you know, finding lamb is kind of a hard challenge. Finding duck in Cleveland, not in the country. We don't live in the country. We live in the city. You know, we live in the city. <laughs> Finding lamb and goat and duck and rabbit, non-commercially farmed meat, sources of protein, you know. I mean, it's been a challenge, and it's time-consuming. And that's one of the aspects of having a disability is it is time-consuming. It eats up bits of your time that other people normally take for granted or normally do not have to stop and think about the time involved that it takes to do something. So like my daughter, she now has a lot more in her diet than she was able to eat, but I still can't go out to a restaurant with her and order food. There's no way. I have to pack something every single time we go anywhere. Anytime we leave the house, I have to pack a meal for her, snacks for her, her medical liquid diet. I have to make sure that everything she is possibly going to consume within the time period that we are out of the house is with us because there's no guarantee I can get it out. It's, it's overwhelming, it's frustrating, right? People who have gluten issues, people who have celiac, that can kill them eventually. You know, there have been connections, there's research that is connecting celiac that goes untreated and on, where they don't take care of it, where they continue to eat gluten, 
and stomach cancer. And stomach cancer is in what, the top three fatal cancers? It's one of the most three fatal cancers untreatable. I mean, there, there are correlations that our food is Okay, that's another workshop altogether too. I won't go into the, I won't go into my food tangent. <laughs> well, yes, and, and we, we have a whiteboard at our Grove where people put their food allergies on and you know, it's, it's a huge deal to label, but I mean, we have someone who's anaphylactically allergic to celery, celery seed, celery juice. You know how many wow. things that's in? Celery is in Especially yes. celery seed is a seasoning. It's in just and anything that says and spices, yes, wow. she can't have that. Wow. And it, it, her throat will close. And bananas. And it, 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 it was a big long story, but yeah, we're very very cognizant of and we have people pollux. that could die <laughs> at right. our high rise. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I carry, nor is EpiPen is in the bag right over there. I carry EpiPens with us all over the place. Which actually ended up working out because a friend of mine and I were out at a restaurant and he ordered shrimp and I ordered, um, they actually had gluten-free fried mushrooms. I hadn't had fried mushrooms in like six years since I had to go gluten-free and I was so excited. And the waitress bought the food over and put the food down at the table and the music was really loud. She made eye contact with me, so I knew that it was my food. He didn't see her make eye contact with me. He thought it was his shrimp, took a bite of the fried mushrooms. He's allergic to mushrooms, like anaphylaxis, allergic to mushrooms. But the problem is, he hasn't had a mushroom in a while because he's anaphylaxic allergic, and anaphylaxis allergic, and he used to like mushrooms. So he was like, hmm, this is a weird taste. Oh crap. You know, like, <laughs> so we were able to handle it. You know, he went to the bathroom and was able to get himself to get it back up. So he thought fast on that. Like, he thought fast. He reacted very well and he thought very fast. And I pulled out Nora's bottle of Benadryl that I carry because I carry Benadryl with me and I carry the EpiPen. I, I, brought, I grabbed out the bottle of Benadryl, handed it to him, he chugged the bottle of Benadryl, which is what they say sometimes, is you can down a bottle of Benadryl before you take the oven, you know, mm -hmm. in case that will actually help. But of course it takes half an hour for the Benadryl to kick in. So then we were playing the waiting game of sitting at the table, trying not to stress out and trying not, to, once again, I'm trying not to crowd him and to not like, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay, but I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm going to ignore you and, and try and like, act like I'm not freaking out, but, you know, <laughs> but I know that's not going to help, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but fortunately, as he was starting to have some breathing issues, at like the 25 minute, 28 minute, half hour point, the Benadryl kicked in. And so we were fine, but we had the EpiPen out on the table. It was a simple mistake, but it could have been disastrous. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been horribly disastrous. We've actually, because we're working with food issues in our grove as well, because of Nora's dietary issues and my dietary issues, and we have two people in our grove that have mushroom issues, allerg allergies to mushrooms, and we have other allergies as well too. Um, but because we have people that also have food allergies, one of the things we've started doing is note cards, asking people to write all of the ingredients on the note card if they can think of it. That's a great idea with the dry erase board, though. We might steal that from you, if that's okay with you. <laughs> well, it, it, it triggers people's minds, because if you're, yeah. you're writing down the ingredients, and you're looking up here, and you're like, celery? What? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's the celery, celery seed, celery juice, celery powder, you know, it's all written up there. It's, yeah. And, and no. And spices. Wouldn't. Yeah, and spices. <coughs> Natural flavors, right. natural flavors on a package. That's like anything. I found out that natural flavors, when I call manufacturer, because I used to have to call manufacturing companies all the time in order before I could give her something. I still kind of do, but it now I, I've just kind of learned to play it by ear and like depend on the company and the brand and all that other stuff. But did you know that dairy could be a natural flavor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
and they don't have to actually mark it as dairy mm -hmm. on the actual nutrition label. That blew my mind. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, <laughs> traces of dairy, in, I mean, small traces of dairy to where they don't think it's important enough to report it. What if you have a severe enough allergy, though, that that could be detrimental to you? It's not important enough, though. <laughs> it's just natural flavoring. Oh, well. <laughs> crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I don't know which one it is, but it's either something from wheat or something from barley, and my wife knows which one it is, that can, make, it can be listed as natural flavors and means it's not gluten-free. But you don't know because it just says natural flavors. Yeah. Yeah, and also, unless something is actually labeled gluten-free, it could not be gluten-free. Even if there aren't any ingredients in the package, like in the ingredients list, even if it doesn't have an item in it that is listed that is one of a gluten-containing ingredient, it can still have gluten in it because if it's made in a factory that had flour, that has flour in it, think about it. When you make something in your kitchen, when you're making, like if you're making something with dough, flour gets all over the place, all over the place. You know, roll it up, like let's say you're making a pizza dough, you know, and your the flour gets all over the place. When you're in a big factory and you've got all that dough going everywhere, and then you've got those big industrial fan systems with the air circulating and everything, it's all over the place. And if you're really that sensitive, trace amounts of flour are going to get all over the place. You're going to be covered in flour. There's going to be little fine, it's going to be like dust, but it's going to be there. And if that food particle, if that item of food is on a conveyor belt, five machines down, but it's still going through the dust of the wheat flour, it's gluten. You got gluten in that. You know? that There's gluten in that. So that's why, I mean, Having the FDA regulate gluten-free packaging was huge victory, actually, for people with gluten issues because they actually really were stringent. They went very low with the requirements. So they are being um, very, very, very persnickety-picky. So, I mean, I guess everyone could always have a complaint about where they could have gone lower, but, you know, I, I, it works for us. So if something isn't labeled gluten-free, you can't get it for someone that has celiac or someone who has gluten issues unless it says on the package gluten free. It's got to say gluten free on it though. So, yeah. So, um, I have a question because you were talking about pizza and the whole like you can get gluten free pizza, but if it's made in the same place the regular pizza is, they are made in dedicated has... factories. Okay. Yeah, they're made so in So, if you go to like a restaurant though, it's still going to have that trace. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And when when you're gluten free, you're you're aware of that usually. If you have a good nutritionist who's taught you that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. My my aunt, she um, we had gotten her gluten free pizza, but I that hadn't been. I, I I'm gonna talk to her about that because that's a good thing. Cross that she contamination know yeah. is a real thing. Like for example, my daughter has severe issues with all of these various items. She can't have dairy, eggs, gluten, soy, etc. I cannot use a spatula that I have made eggs with. Like, oh, okay, better example. I, let's say I have a knife that I am putting butter on my vegetables with. And then she has her earth balance, soy free, vegan butter that she uses. I can't use the same knife because there are trace amounts of dairy on the knife that I just used on my butter. I have to use a separate knife on hers. And I can't set that knife that I use hers with down on the same spot on the countertop because you set it down in the butter, you've got butter on it now. You've got traces of butter on it. You know, it's, it's that's why when you get into food allergies, it's a disability too. It's a, you have to, there are things you have to do, accommodations, you have to tiptoe around all sorts of things that people don't normally think about. Yeah. Well, I, one uh, aspect is the very best restaurants that have gluten-free stuff have their own separate area for all the gluten-free stuff. Probably not the same level, so if they're making pizza, maybe you don't want to go there. But uh, 
they, you know, places that aren't doing quite so much with flour might be okay, but so, only some of them have that. Mm -hmm. Some of them will just prepare it on the regular line and all that, and that gets to be much more of a game. Yeah. It's along the lines of uh, eating kosher. Yeah. yeah. I know a lady who is Jewish who has two separate dishwashers mm -hmm. because she doesn't even want the same stuff. I have two separate sponges that I use because in my kitchen. I don't use the same sponge to wash some of my stuff. I wish I had two separate dishwashers. That would be great. <laughs> I could get twice the amount of dishes done. <laughs> but, like, yeah, with the kosher, that's a similar mentality. You know, keeping things absolutely separate. It's, it's huge. That's a great example, actually. Yeah. I had lived kosher for a couple of weeks because oh. working at a scout camp with a Orthodox Jewish troop. Oh. It was really interesting to learn that culture and seeing yeah. that in practice. But that's, yeah, that's what it's reminding me. I don't know enough about it. Uh, yeah. But yeah. you'll also see a lot of labels on, especially candy bars, uh, made in factory with peanuts. Not necessarily any peanuts in the, yes. in the product itself, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's huge as well because peanut allergies. Okay, so that's another example. <coughs> I have a friend of mine who also has a son who has EOE. And EOE, that's the acronym. I'm sorry, I said to watch acronyms and then I'm throwing an acronym out at y'all, sorry. EOE stands for eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and that acronym I do throw out pretty regularly because eosinophilic esophagitis is a mouthful. Um, but I have a friend of mine who has a son that has EOE. And EOE does not equal having the neurological issues that Nora has, just to give you a heads up. And a lot of people actually that I know, I did not realize this until recently, they thought that that actually was part and parcel, which it's not, but they didn't know anybody else who has it, so there you go. Um, so he has such severe peanut allergies that they were, they were meeting friends of theirs out at the mall for a play date. It was in the middle of the winter, had a cabin fever, they wanted to get the heck out of the house. They were meeting friends of theirs out at the mall. The friends had stopped at Chick-fil-A for lunch, like a couple hours prior. And the little boys got together, hugged each other, and he reacted. Because the, he, the other little friend still had peanut residue from the peanut oil on his hands from the Chick-fil-A lunch like a couple hours later. It equaled a hospital trip. Like, crazy. You know, like, who would think of something like that, though? Don't I walk mean, by five guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't drive by five guys at all. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but that's the kind of stuff that, I mean, <coughs> now, little note of fact, Peanuts are a very highly genetically modified crop. Mm -hmm. So is wheat, so is corn, so is soy. <sighs> I don't know. And like is it black, black phosphate <laughs> sprayed on all of them? Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. they think a whole lot of the... the oh, uh, no, they're stuff that they don't cause any issues. Right, food, food yeah. allergies that, that people are having to wheat, are, and unless it's full-on celiac, which has its own symptoms, right. but there are a whole lot of people with sensitivities to wheat now, and the last thing they do to wheat before they uh, harvest it is spray it down with glyphosate because it yep. makes everything turn nice and brown, it makes Evenly. it easier for them to harvest. And so, you, yeah. Yep. You don't even want to think about how much of the stuff that we're ingesting. Yeah. And word, word of interest for that, EOE didn't exist 30 years ago. Like, it's not like they didn't understand what it was. I mean, at least that's the theory. You know, it's not like they just didn't understand what it was or it was there and they just didn't diagnose it correctly. It did not exist. Our bodies were not producing this disease. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that our bodies have suddenly, spontaneously started doing this mm -hmm. for no reason. Like, and it's not like it's an easy disease to deal with. 
I mean, it, it affects every aspect of our lives. It's, it's a disability, you know? And, but try telling the Board of DD that. Oh my gosh, Board of DD doesn't even, they're not even catching up to food issues yet, which is why I think that they're in the same realm. They affect every aspect of your life. They're time consuming, they can be crippling, and they can kill you mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm treated properly. Well, it's like, it's like anything. There are people who have <clears throat> like food allergies that, you know, it's like, okay, okay, like I have an allergy to mangoes. I avoid mangoes. I don't, you know, it doesn't bother right. me. It doesn't take yeah. anything out of my life. It's not ubiquitous. It's not like soy or something that's in a lot of foods. Right. But it's also, like I say about everything, everything's a spectrum of life. And, yeah. you know, the problem is, is that agencies have, if you have this, then therefore, if you can fall into the category of it's not a big deal, therefore everyone doesn't have a big deal with it. We ha the, the broader agencies haven't shifted their algorithms to match the fact yeah. that if you're on the severe end of any condition, that there needs to be accommodations for it. Whereas someone who has it kind of, you know, I got off easy, no allergic to make them, I can very easily avoid it. Right. Versus someone like you, where, as you say, soy is in like 90% of the things Everything. that are, <laughs> you know, that you're eating. Everything. I miss Chinese food. Yeah. I miss Chinese. <laughs> so. But yeah, that's a good point. 